Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. Today's review is once again Steampunk. And it's time to recognize a man who was very instrumental in the movement. In fact, he coined the term Steampunk way back in the 1980s. And he wrote four Steampunk novels, which I'm going to review today. He is from California, a boy in a park to be exact. At least he went to school there. And as an American, he did a pretty good job getting all the Britishisms right. I'm talking about K.W. Jeter, the man who invented steampunk. Now, K.W. Jeter wrote four steampunk novels. He's written a fair number of others, particularly in cyberpunk, some horror. He was an early luminary in the cyberpunk movement as well, which is kind of where he got the steampunk name from. He writes dark and sympathetic characters, which is not surprising since back in the day he was friends with the great Philip K. Dick. So anyway, Jeter coined the term steampunk back in 1986 in a letter to Locus Magazine. I believe he was promoting Morlock Knight. And he was saying, this is like cyberpunk, except it's in the age of steam. So perhaps we should call these people steampunks. It was kind of just a very casual remark, off the cuff. And, wow, it really stuck. <laughs> so, the books are, starting with Morlock Knight in 1979, which is kind of a one-off, involving kind of a sequel to H.G. Wells' Time Machine, which is another kind of steampunk in the sense that this is written sort of like Victorian sci-fi, right? The other ones are a trilogy, starting with Infernal Devices, written in 1987, and followed up way, way along in 2013 with Fiendish Schemes and 2017 with Grim Expectations. Great titles there, I really have to say. So let's go over these books one by one, hopefully briefly. I don't want to have to cut so much. <laughs> I do tend to ramble, don't I? Anyway, first of all, Morlock Knight. And it is a rather short book, kind of a novella, and again, as I said, it was a sequel to The Time Machine. And it starts where The Time Machine left off. The guy's walking home, the narrator, who is listening to the time traveler's story. And he goes through some mysterious fog, and suddenly London has changed. It's under attack. There's a war zone. Buildings are, like, busted up and, and broken, and there's people firing guns everywhere, and it looks like... There's been an invasion. What happened? Just all of a sudden. Well, as it turns out, the Morlocks happened to get a hold of the time traveler's machine. And since this is time travel, you know, he could have gone, gone back uh, really quickly. And in fact, I think he does say he's going to go back. So he goes back, and then the Morlocks say, Wow, we took this. Because you know, they were the uh, bad guys. They were the flesh-eating monsters from under the ground. And they realized that back in the time traveler's time, there's lots of fresh meat. So they've come back to attack England, and England is really unprepared. They don't know what to do. And these guys have, you know, better tech. Our narrator, who I believe is unnamed, if I remember correctly, he has to help find somebody who can help England. And this mysterious figure appears, who does seem to be a leader. Seems to have this leadership quality. And... I believe it's some kind of military guy, but it just turns out that it's King Arthur come back to save England, just like the legend says. So it's very cool and it's, that it melds the sequel to Time Machine with the Arthurian legend, and it's got a lot of exciting stuff in it. Moving on, we go to Infernal Devices 1987, where steampunk really starts to get rolling. Uh, published by St. Martin's Press, and it's the first of the so-called George Dower trilogy. And George kind of deserves his name, let's say. It was republished in 2011 by Angry Robot Books, at the height of the steampunk boom. There's an audiobook with a narrator, Michael Page. I haven't heard it, just noting that. So George Dower is this, is this character, I forget, I don't know, he's a young man, but he's not real young. He's kind of a He's kind of done really nothing. He's not married. He doesn't have much of a job. And he's inherited his father's clock shop in London. 
And the father was a genius, but George has absolutely no mechanical aptitude, none whatsoever. And so he's just trying to get by. He's just trying to figure this out and survive and keep the shop open. So one day this mysterious man shows up with this, um, well, he's got a very brown face. At first, uh, George thinks he's an African, but it turns out he's wearing a brown leather mask. It's weird. <laughs> and so this guy hands him this mysterious clockwork device. He says, I know you can fix this because I've heard about, you know, your shop can do anything. <laughs> well, <laughs> that was the father. But George doesn't tell him. So George looks at it and says, oh my God, I didn't know what this does. So he has to start investigating and in his investigation he runs into all these bizarre people. All these strange, uh, strange, strange groups like the Royal Anti-Society. They're kind of the opposite of the Royal Society, you know, that uh, scientific group. There's the Godly Army. <laughs> it's one of these you know, religious organizations and the Ladies' Union for Suppression of Carnal Vice. <laughs> so anyway, in the, in the process, he also meets this weird couple, Mr. Scape and Miss McThane. They dress weirdly and they talk weirdly. And we readers know that they're talking like modern 20th century English. Well, it turns out that they have a special device. They can look into the future and they have been able to, you know, copy the fashions and to read the lips so they can use this slang. So they continue George on his path to weirdness. He finally goes to this Lord's house for some kind of reception and discovers that there is a perfect duplicate of him that's a violin virtuoso, just like Paganini. It's something his father made, just absolute copy, automaton, let's say, and it's also a sexual dynamo. <laughs> so women just want to be with this, be with this what they think is a man, and he gets confused with a robot, and you would think, an average man would think, oh, this is okay, I like this, but no, he's such a prig that he just doesn't like this at all. And so things go to a head and they get very, very exciting and the world is in danger and all this stuff and George has to try to save it. So the next two, I'm going to cut down the explanations a little bit more because you kind of know what the character is, who he is and what he's like and, and some of these other ancillary characters. Fiendish Schemes, published in 2013, I think they probably decided hey, we need some more steampunk from you now that is so popular. So, this one had a audiobook version that was narrated by Justine Eyre, different person. And it was also published by Angry Robot Books. Now, this continues the cynical tone of the first one, but it's not quite as lighthearted. It starts out as George is trying to pay off some debts that his father's estate owes because he had these musical automata, these robot choir in this church, they went berserk and wrecked the church, so he's got to try to pay them back. And so he's looking for some kind of scientific post with the government. So he goes to this reception for the unveiling of another one of his father's amazing inventions, a walking lighthouse. It's got these giant mechanical legs so it can go where it's needed. And, you know, that doesn't go too well either, of course. So he ends up hooking up with Mr. Scape again. And he also discovers that there's this weird device called the Vox Universalis that uh, everybody's looking for, and people are kidnapping poor George and drugging him because it's one of his father's inventions and everybody wants it. But George doesn't even know where it is. <laughs> and so, at least not at first. So, Mr. Scape's supposed to help him find it. But in the process, Mr. Scape has to show him all this weird stuff that's happened because. George has kind of been in hiding, who doesn't know all the bizarre stuff, like people becoming melded with machines, instead of cyborgs, they're like steamborgs. <laughs> they're like, the Prime Minister is a lady, and she's uh, been hybridized with a locomotive, and she's terrifying. She's the Iron Lady, get it? Ha 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 ha. There's steam, steam everywhere because London decided, or England decided, to switch to geothermal power. Good idea, you would say but they overdid it, and now there's steam everywhere, and England is turned into a tropical hellhole. <laughs> you gotta go negative, don't you? Don't you, KW? So again, there's kind of a climactic ending, or we might say climatic, right? But 
That continues with Grim Expectations 2017, also Angry Robot, and they went back to the original narrator, Michael Page. Now, this one is even darker and more cynical than the first. In fact, it gets kind of depressing. And there's more bizarre innovations, like floating graveyards. It's kind of disgusting, but the idea is that the gases from the corpses allow this graveyard to float like a dirigible, <laughs> believe it or not. So, as it happens, Escape has died. Miss McThane hooked up with George, and they are living in an estate in Cornwall. So they've been kind of cut off again. Now, she dies and leaves him this box full of letters. And he starts reading them and discovers that she was searching for somebody. And she had just found this person, but hadn't been able to actually retrieve them or, or contact them. So he goes off on a mission to see what was up. And in the process, you know, he discovers that there's even more dark stuff going on, especially like with abuse of children in, in industry and so on. So it's, it's kind of depressing. And, and you know, it, his search doesn't go as well as it could, I suppose. And so, again, it ends up kind of with a big bang and maybe not a happy ending. <laughs> So let's go into pros and cons. I'm going to start with Morlock Knight very briefly. I love it. It's a great mashup of Victoriana and King Arthur's Legends with Merlin and all that stuff. And I always love good, a good mashup, you know, like this album I have of basically Lou Reed playing with Metallica. Stuff like that, you know, crazy stuff that doesn't belong together. <clears throat> In this case, it does. All this stuff, including Morlock Knight and the George Dower tri Trilogy, is very creative. There's lots of wonderful steampunk gizmos and gadgets, and some that aren't so wonderful, but are still bizarre and amazing. They have conspiracies and secret organizations. You can't have a good uh, steampunk novel without them. You know, the, the, Victorian and, the Victorians and their Illuminati stuff, of course. The dialogue is perfect very British, as far as I can tell by my American sensibilities. And the humor is quite cynical and dark, which is enjoyable at times. Uh, finally, I have to note that I did listen to the second audiobook with Justine Eyre, and she has the most wonderful voice, very British, very sophisticated, very, very cultured, and kind of alluring. And if I wasn't already married, I'd be in love. <laughs> Just letting you know. I have a thing for a great voice, and she has one, certainly. So here are the cons. The only con I'd say for Morlock Knight, well, it's a little bit rough in places, but it's also rather too short. Should have gone on a little, little longer and developed, you know, the Arthur character a little bit more slowly, or a little bit more gradually, let's say. As far as the George Dower trilogy, he is an unlikable hero and he really doesn't grow as a character. In fact, he kind of gets worse. You know, when you, you think when he gets in a relationship with Miss McThane, at least he's not alone anymore, and maybe he's not such a terrible guy if she can put up with him. But, you know, he just he just very passive, kind of lets life uh, hand him everything, or not, as the case may be. And by the third, he's getting very, very negative and pessimistic. Now, though the first novel is paced fine, the second one has some pacing issues, it's particularly in the first half, where Mr. Scape is showing George all these weird things that have happened, all these bizarre uh, human-machine hybrids, and all the, uh, the steam pipes from the geothermal energy, and all, the, all that stuff. So that's a little bit too much exposition, and so it makes it kind of slow. The third one, the third one is uh, even more dystopian and it's depressing and that's what I don't like about it. And the second one is still absurdist enough to be funny, but the third one, uh, to me the humor doesn't hit home. And I've seen a lot of reviews that say the same thing, that you know the third is not at all good as the first. Although strangely, some people thought the third was better than the second, which I thought was totally not right. <laughs> to each his own. So as far as recommendations, I would say 
Morlock Knight, 5 out of 5 gears, despite its small flaws. Uh, basically, Infernal Devices, 5 out of 5 gears, because it's so groundbreaking, it's so imaginative and fun. The second one, Fiendish Schemes, 4 out of 5. It just doesn't move as well, and there's just not as much lightheartedness in this one. Finally, the third, Grim Expectations, 3 out of 5. I don't know if I've ever given a, a uh, rating so low, or I rarely do, because I just didn't enjoy it. In fact, I'm tempted to give it 2.5. So I highly recommend those first two, Morlock Knight and uh, Infernal Devices. The second one, or the second one in the trilogy, with Reservations, I recommend it. It's a little... It's a little body, so if you are turned off by bizarre sex, don't read it. And the third, I can't really recommend it at all unless you're really, really into the grimdark stuff. So that's my review of the steampunk works of K.W. Jeter. One of these days I will read one of his cyberpunks and let you know how it is. Please let me know if you do know Jeter's works and what you think about them. What you think I'm all wet or what? Also, please check out my works on Amazon. I'll leave the links in the description below and like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.